What defines success for me is yes, spreading future key and future key actually working. Like this is a real credible shot at making history, right? It's not very often that a new form of governance came along. And that's not something you can say about many things and institutions. All right, everyone, this episode is brought to you by Monad, an L1 bringing performance to the EVM with parallel execution and both a custom consensus engine and new database solution. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. All righty, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. We are joined today by Robin Hansen, an economist at George Mason and Profit, the founder of MetaDAO. While this may seem like an atypical combination of people, if you're unfamiliar with either, there is a very obvious connection here. Uh, so Robin founded the idea of Futarchy, which is a concept of using speculative markets as an information aggregation mechanism, really to address just the ideas and failures of the traditional democratic decision-making process. And, and ultimately, this led Profit to building MetaDAO. Uh, which is bringing futarchy from theory into reality. So, Robin, maybe a great place to kick things off here is really just to dive in on what futarchy is and kind of just walk us through the key concepts of it and really what led you down to the path to kind of bringing this into into the into the world. So, the first concept here is just prediction markets. Long ago, I did philosophy of science, and I was hanging out with people who were founding the web before there was a web. They had visions of how it could change the world. And I came to doubt some of those visions and asked what else could you do to sort of fix their problem they saw of the world having broad, broken consensus on key issues. And I realized since they were pretty libertarian and I was infused in that world that just betting markets could be a way to create consensus uh, that we could all trust and create incentives for aggregation of information. And I started writing and talking about that 35 years ago. <laughs> and uh, then over the next 10 years, I thought a lot about various particular issues. And I came to realize that you know, the most valuable applications of prediction markets would be when they were closest to decisions, because the value of information is that it can inform decisions. And so I realized that a, a particularly potent form of a prediction market would be a market where it predicted an outcome conditional on a decision. So I call that a decision market and was trying to get people interested in trying out decision markets to advise decisions. And um, I had the idea that if I could up the ante from examples, I might inspire people more. So I tried to talk about using this for governance decisions, um, decision markets for governance, which that I called Futarchy. So the key idea then is to, uh, as a governance community agree on an outcome measure. So if it was a company, we might agree on the stock price. Um, another, you know, if it was an event, we might agree on the number of attendees or something. And uh, then we could decide things by people would propose policies and we could ask markets, well, conditional on adopting this policy, what do we expect the outcome to be? And then we could adopt the policies that the markets expect to produce the better outcomes. And that basically is your turkey. <laughs> Uh, but I tried to describe it in terms of, you know, cities and nations, et cetera, to make you inspired by just how far we could go with this so that we could get small scale trials, but really haven't induced much away in small scale trials in these 25 years since then. <laughs> now, there are like in, unintended examples, like there are markets on elections, which give you the odds of someone being nominated and the odds that they'll win. And so the ratio of that is the conditional chance that they will win if nominated, which is advice to the parties on whether they should nominate a particular person. And so that's, in essence, a decision market, but not actually followed much. And so now that there's more actual experiments, I'm excited <laughs> to uh, get them going and, and see what happens. Fantastic. And Maybe if you could walk us through the CEO example uh, that you've that you've done before, I think this is like super. It's very straightforward and a great way to like set the context in the right. audience. So for a firm, we might say the key outcome we want is the capital value of the company. How much is the company worth? That is the number of stocks times the price of each stock, and we want to manage the company so that that number is higher. 
Um, and so one of the key decisions we might want to make about a firm is whether to keep the current CEO or get rid of them and replace them with another. And that's a very simple binary choice, get rid of the CEO or not. And uh, so what we're going to do is have conditional stock markets or called off stock markets. So in an ordinary stock market, you trade stock for cash. So the price of the company might be $22 a stock. If you think it's worth more, you buy, paying cash to get the stock. If you think it's worth less, you sell, you sell the stock to um, get cash. And you reveal your information or your expectations about the value of the company through those sorts of unconditional trades. So now we're going to ask, we're going to make conditional markets where you make a trade of stock for cash, but that trade is called off if the condition isn't met. And so we'll make the market where you trade stock for cash conditional on the CEO staying in office through the end of the quarter and conditional on the CEO not staying in office through the end of the quarter. So now when you trade in those markets, uh, you should average over all the scenarios consistent with the condition when you try to estimate the value of the stock. Usually in an ordinary stock market, you just average over all the scenarios the stock could be in. And you'd ask yourself in each scenario, how much is the company worth and what's the chance of each scenario? Average that up and you get what you think the stock's worth. Now you're going to do that, but only for the scenarios consistent with the condition, i.e. the CEO stays or leaves, because if that condition isn't true, the trade's going to be called off and as if the trade never happened. So now we look at these two prices. How much is the company worth if the CEO stays and how much is the company worth if the CEO leaves? And if the first price is higher than the second one, that's telling you speculators think this company is worth more keeping the CEO, then that's what you should do. But if they say the company is worth more without the CEO, then that's a recommendation to get rid of them, place them with somebody else. You could do a similar sort of markets. If you had particular candidates for someone else, you could ask specifically which one you should adopt. And you, the idea is you just repeatedly follow the market advice. And if, for example, we could get, you know, markets on the entire Fortune 500, <laughs> Then over a couple of years, we could track all of the companies and compare the prices and the return on the stocks that follow the market advice to the companies that don't follow the market advice, and then maybe get a overall evaluation of whether this helps the companies. So that's what you could do if you could set up markets on lots of companies about stock price conditional on keeping the CEO. And so you mentioned that, you know, you've seen a lack of adoption over the last 25 years. What has been the core criticisms to implementing this or, or some of the key roadblocks that, by people that were interested but never actually took it to the next level? Well, the there's this larger category of prediction markets. And um, in this large space of prediction markets, there's the very simplest possible applications and the simplest technology. And then there are many more advanced variations that people have envisioned and, you know, consider doing. And so what's happened is that people have struggled to just do the simplest things. Uh, and so have in given those struggles have been reluctant to go even the next small levels of complexity. Uh, they base, which makes sense. If you can't make the simple things work, you don't, don't try to make more complicated things work first. And so these decision markets are a little bit more complicated than the simplest prediction markets. And so people have thought, that say if user complexity, you know, user interface complexity, user cognitive overload, et cetera, is an obstacle, then let's keep it really simple. And so they have kept it really simple. But even then, the key obstacle typically is organizational disruption. So uh, you can try to make markets like in the public sphere for just ordinary people to trade on to have fun. You have le legal obstacles there, but you also just have you know, people have fun with sports betting because it's fast and they like sports, but they're not so entertained by trading on random business decisions. So they don't, you know, um, aren't eagerly drawn to those. So the, 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 the hoped for market here is that organizations who want to know things so that they can make key decisions will pay to make the markets uh, that they need and to subsidize trading and to get the answers they need. And organizational disruption, political disruption has been a big obstacle there. So in most organizations, uh, the people who manage them are very sensitive to issues about controlling perceptions and uh, managing what people believe about the organization. And so prediction markets are basically out of control. You can set them up and then you don't know what they're going to say and you can't really punish them for saying the wrong thing. 
And that's an obstacle for most political styles of managing organizations. Uh, and so it's rare to find organizational leaders like Profit <laughs> willing to um, take accept that disruption and say, ask a question and then not know the answer <laughs> and maybe find that the answer isn't what they wanted. Okay, guys, quick break from the episode to talk to you about Monad, the L1 optimizing the performance of the EVM. The team is working to materially advance the efficient frontier in the trade-off between decentralization and scalability. The internal DevNet is currently live and public testnet is coming soon. And testing on the internal DevNet uh, indicates that the chain can handle up to about 10,000 transactions per second, significantly increasing the throughput capabilities of the EVM. This, of course, opens doors for new applications and more interesting use cases, even those with greater complexity and higher usage, to run in a decentralized manner. Importantly, Monad is fully compatible with the EVM and the Ethereum RPC API, which provides EVM developers with the seamless portability for their applications. Given the popularity of the EVM today, this is really a no-brainer. To stay up to date with all of the latest developments, join the Monad community by following them on Twitter and jumping in the Discord. They're a lively bunch, so hit the links in the description below. All right, let's get back to the episode. And that's probably a great segue to, to expand on what you're building uh, with MetaDAO Profit. What was, what's the origin story behind this? I, I'd love to hear where you originally uh, kind of heard the idea of Futarchy and what inspired you to kind of bring it on chain. Uh, sure, yeah. So I used to work for Web2, uh, and then I worked for DeFi DAOs. And with both of those was kind of uh, just, yeah, disappointed with, the way that the organizations worked and that there would often be decisions that were made not in the interest of the overall organization, but in the interest of like some policy within that organization. Um, I don't remember how I found Futarchy. I think it was like an old, uh, I mean, Vitalik uh, used to talk about it back in like 2015 and um, some various people in the Ethereum space talked about it. I think I may have found one of their videos online uh, and then when I read about it, I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. Uh, and why has no one ever done this before? Like, that's stupid. Uh, and so, yeah, I pretty much dropped uh, what I was working on then. Uh, this was November 2022. So actually, the MetaDAO white paper was released two days after FTX crashed, uh, which was a fun time to be building on Solana. Um, and uh, yeah, and so uh, we built the MetaDAO, or MetaDAO, which is, uh, to my knowledge, the first uh, future key. Um, and yeah. All right. So I chose this EEO example earlier of, of all the many examples of when this application made sense, because in my head, it seems very like, it's it's really easy to grasp the idea of having um, this stock price that like this, this stock uh, like the the actual vehicle that already exists and that can be like bifurcated into the like these yes no markets um, and then like that's the the vehicle of, of these that creates a decision market um, and so that's why I, I chose that specifically because I'd love to hear a little bit more about the technical implementation um, about how you guys actually run these markets on chain uh, so if you can talk about like the meta token and its role and then like maybe walk us through an example vote uh, where like the token actually gets bifurcated into two markets uh, and then like how the the outcome actually works so every decision starts with a proposal so someone will raise a proposal and that proposal contains a uh, Solana virtual machine instruction uh, and that Solana virtual machine instruction will normally uh, be something like moving money. So like right now, there's an active proposal live for a, for a project that hopes to generate revenue. And the actual instruction is to move a bunch of uh, tokens to this address so that they can pay for building the project. Um, and so you publish that on chain. Uh, and while you're doing that, you create two open book markets. Uh, you have a pass market and a fail market. Uh, and in those markets, you trade conditional tokens. Uh, so like, yeah, say, uh, and the markets are for the native meta token. Uh, and so say, in this proposal, I think that meta would be worth like $100. Uh, and I would be willing to buy if it passed at $100. What I would take is I would take my US dollars or my USDC, I would lock that in and I would get back, let's just say, uh, yeah, I want to buy one meta at $100 if this passes. So I take my US, 100 USDC, I lock it in, I get back 100 past USDC and 100 fail USDC. So at this point, 
no matter what happens, I'm going to get back my original 100 USDC, right? Because if it passes, I'll be able to redeem my past US, 100 past USDC for regular USDC. And if it fails, I'll be able to redeem my fail USDC for normal USDC. Now what I can do is I can place a limit order or a bid uh, in the past market, and I'm going to place a bid of 100 past USDC for one past meta. And then if someone takes against me, so they want to bet against me, they think, uh, yeah, they'd be willing to sell their meta for, for less than 100 USDC if it passes, uh, then I would get their one pass meta. And so now at this point, I've got one pass meta and 100 fail USDC. And that way, if the proposal passes, I'll be able to redeem my uh, pass USDC for regular, or sorry, my pass meta for regular meta, and I'll be able to redeem my fail USDC for USDC. And so it allows me to place conditional trades for meta. Um, and yeah, we run those today. We run those markets for five days. Uh, a time weighted average price is collected in both of those. Uh, and then at the end of the five days, uh, the on chain program just automatically looks at the two time weighted average prices and, uh, does pretty much whichever price is higher. Okay, right. And so I guess one of the the important pieces here is if you, like, let's say the proposal passes, but you bet on the no market, like you still, you're able to withdraw the USDC you deposited into that no market. Do I have that correct? Yeah, any, it would be like any trades you placed in the no market reverted. Uh, that's essentially what we use conditional tokens because we can't actually revert transactions on a blockchain. Like you can't do that. But uh, yeah, it's essentially like you're reverting all the trades. Okay. And so walk us through maybe like there was a recent Pantera vote that kind of was a, it was a good example of like a practical implementation. Um, can you walk us through that vote specifically and kind of what, what it, what it was for and what the outcome was? Sure. Uh, yeah. So that was proposal seven, I believe. Um, and yeah, Pantera wanted to buy $50,000 worth of meta tokens from the treasury. And so they had an uh, instruction that transferred, uh, uh, yeah, some, I think 500 meta, and they wanted to pay a maximum of $100. Uh, and then after they created that proposal, the spot price uh, spikes. And so the proposal failed because people deemed that meta was less valuable if the proposal passed. Um, what I think maybe a more interesting proposal to talk about is the prior proposal, proposal six, where Ben Hawkins, uh, who works for Solana Foundation, although he, he was acting like as an independent person, uh, he created a similar proposal to buy $50,000 worth of meta from the treasury. Uh, and his, he spent, because uh, like a lot of people, when they hear first about Feature, they're like, okay, this is just voting by rich people, right? Like rich people can obviously manipulate this. Uh, he spent, uh, so he, his proposal was to buy 50 K worth of meta. He spent $250,000 in the past markets trying to bid up the past price so that the market would pass so that the proposal would pass and it failed. Like those trades were all reverted in the, because every time he would place high bids, people are like, oh, sick. This guy is, well, he's willing to pay above market price for meta and I'll be able to, like lock in uh, a sale to him at like, I don't know, call it 200 bucks. And then after this proposal finishes, I'll be able to buy it back for like a hundred. Uh, and so, yeah, done, I'll sell to you. Uh, and then people would do that. And then that would push the price back down to where it was before. Uh, and so it was kind of cool to see the uh display manipulation resistance. Maybe if you can expand on how the interplay between the spot price and, and say one of the DEXs on Solana and like when you get a large vote like this, like how is the spot price uh, on a DEX like reacting to the activity in these markets, if at all? Uh, so the spot price should converge to whichever proposal or whichever market is likely to be finalized. So if a proposal is 100% going to pass, uh, then the spot price and the past market price should be the same. And if a hundred pr proposal is definitely going to fail, then the fail price and the spot price should be the same. Uh, yeah. The, the spot price should just equal 
the weighted average of the two conditional prices weighted by the probability of passing. So if you had a market of the probability of passing, you would just could just directly arbitrage those numbers because any deviation would be pure profit. Right. That makes sense. And I, I like the Ben Hawkins example because that's it sounds like that's exactly what uh, people were doing was kind of like arbing the spot price back in, in line with with his decisions. Is that a fair to say? Uh, yeah, people, I think, did buy the spot price went up. So similarly, people were buying from the spot in order to kind of hedge their bets. Gotcha. OK. And then one thing that I when I was first diving into MetaDAO, I really had my like a very hard time wrapping my head around was it, you know, it was it's a DAO that was created for the specific governance style, right? Like if you think about, you know, DeFi, right? They're created for to like the DAO gets created because they're doing some, you know, financial service on chain, uh, whereas uh, MetaDAO is like doing this governance service on chain. So how like like I guess my question here is like, what's the end goal of MetaDAO? Is it to create some like go- governance as a service model or, or something of this nature where um, you're kind of running these for other DAOs? They're the goals of the humans around MetaDAO. Like, I have my own goals, but the goal of the program that's deployed on chain, which is effectively MetaDAO, because it controls all the financial resources of MetaDAO, is to make number go up. Uh, It wants to increase the value of the tokens. Uh, It wants to make money. And uh, so Voda is, yeah, like the first project that we uh, announced and and released, and hopefully that will make money. and uh, yeah, actually, the proposal that's currently live is for future piece of service. And again, like the goal of that is to make money. Um, I don't know what it is exactly that'll look like, and I actually think that's okay. Uh, I think it's okay that we're building organization first, or like trying to perfect the institution first, because if you look empirically at like the successful. Uh, Successful companies in technology, like all the FANG companies, uh, have interesting institutional innovations, right? Like Netflix and Amazon, they're obvious. That's like been well publicized. Um, uh, Google obviously doesn't run their organization like a typical organization. Uh, Facebook has this interesting thing uh, that I think has been great for them where uh, they allow any engineer to deploy changes uh and they just as long as those changes uh improve their metrics and you don't have to go through this permission process which is like totally different than how most organizations worked uh and then apple uh in steve's jobs his final interview uh at recode uh they asked him what he what they thought he thought was most important to apple's success and he said the organization the way we're structured uh as like a system of startups uh instead of as this like top down hierarchy. Uh, And so it appears that this institution stuff actually matters. Uh, And I want to focus on, and I think that is upstream of uh, business success. And so, yeah. uh, So we don't know exactly where the MetaDAO will be in three years, if it even will exist in three years. Uh, But its goal is to make money. My goal is like, I mean, I think it's kind of cool And my goal and also a lot of people who are working on MetaDAO, uh, like this is a real credible shot at making history, right? It's not very often that a new form of governance came along, right? If we talked about Futarchy in uh, Athens at their council or whatever, or in the Roman Senate, they'd be like, what the hell are these guys talking about? Like, this is crazy. We haven't seen anything like that. Uh, And that's not something you can say about many, uh, many things in this uh and institutions so uh that's like i think a lot of the humans goal um but the dow's goal is just to make money i'm inclined of course to feel that futarchy is a promising governance mechanism to add to an organization but i'm not arrogant enough to think that it's the thing that makes the main difference whether an organization succeeds or fails Uh, you know organizations is very enormously and it's hard to make a good organization and you know i expect that whether this succeeds or fails will be primarily based on other aspects of the organization, you know, uh, the culture, the sense of trust, the camaraderie, the vision, you know, the wisdom, et cetera. All those things will probably matter more to whether this succeeds. But the hope is that adding this element will help. And so if we get enough trials, we'll start to be able to see that this does help. Uh, But 
and you know, alas or for not, the future of Futarchy doesn't depend on whether MetaDAO works. This is one trial. And, you know, honestly, the main thing I hope to see from this trial is hints about what the problems are. <laughs> you know, most innovation is, uh, you know, a simple, ad, elegant idea is mixed with lots of messy details to make it work. And what we're missing is enough experience to work out those messy details. And so that's what I'd like to see from this experiment is how we can tweak and improve the messy details to make this sort of thing work. And the way we're going to find that out is to hear about complaints, about what people don't like about this particular implementation and what the, you know, they didn't like about how it played out and et cetera. That's the way we're going to be able to improve it. So, you know, unfortunately, even though I want everyone to think it's great and I want it to go great, the way to make that happen is to get people to complain about it. One of the complaints I could imagine would come up is you're getting the people in control to to give up their control. So I'm curious how you think about that. Like maybe it's for the net benefit, but you ultimately like there's like a there's plenty of historical proof where the people in power don't want to necessarily walk away. I've been surprised at how uh, how much people like I've talked to some of the what I would consider prominent DeFi DAOs in Solana. And they seem receptive to using Futarchy. Uh, maybe, I mean, I guess the trade is that if they view Futarchy is good uh, and way like a step function above uh, a voting system, uh, they obviously, most of these people own a lot of tokens in their projects. And so they want that token to go up. Uh, if they think it would go more up with a Futarchy than a voting system, they may be financially incentivized to use it. Actually, in politics, often, you know, agency heads don't want to make certain decisions because they don't want to be blamed for them. So there's an opening here for a mechanism they can defer to and not take responsibility for. That's Oh, yeah. Angle. I I leverage this all the time. I, when people ask me for stuff that I don't want to do, I'm just like, I'm sorry, but it's the market's decision. Like, it's not up to me. And it, it is really true. That's the angle to work there for sure then. And so, Robin, I, uh, I listened to some of your old content and uh, one of your pitches from a few years ago, at least that's when I heard it, was for this to work, like for an, impl an implementation to work, somebody is going to get really, really good at doing this and then they're going to do it for people. And this is kind of what this Futarchy as a service, as Profit just talked about, that's uh, being an active proposal right now, is kind of working to do. Is that still in your mind how this would like make sense is to like, get really good at offering this service to other, uh, in, in this case, DeFi protocols? Governance mechanisms over an organization, they have to feel like they're in control. I mean, maybe the software runs somewhere else, but and maybe somebody else wrote the software, but they'll have to feel like they are managing it, that whatever dials are set, they're setting them. Um, so uh, that's different than uh, other applications of prediction markets. So, for example, um, Many organizations, you know, make a lot of hires, and I've thought it was promising for some organization to specialize in helping firms make hire choices by offering them a prediction market that, you know, predicts if you hire this person, what their evaluation would be in a year or two, uh, and going through the effort to sort of try a bunch of different ways to do that and learn and get the experience of how best to set it up and then advise firms on how best to set it up and get them to do it. So when there's something to learn, I think there's a gain from an organization to specialize in being the one who learns that. And then that's their product is they know how to help others do it. Um, for governance, um, the question is how many knobs there could be there. I think people will be less willing to delegate to some other organization a lot of details about governance compared to other aspects of the organization. So I see more promise for you coming to the organization, say, let us do help you with hires or let us help you with scheduling or let us help you with deadlines. The organization is going to be more willing to, de you know, delegate to them some discretion about how exactly to set that up so that they can get the service. But, you know, after some initial experimental period, they may want to, you know, switch to managing it themselves. It's okay, we figured it out now. Thank you for all your help, but we want to be in control of this ourselves. And then they would switch to a model where they were running it themselves. And that makes sense. Uh, and I think for governance, you'd want to go there especially soon. I think organizations would be especially shy about 
feeling they've delegated a lot of things they don't quite understand and can't quite control to someone else about their key governance choices. And profit, what does that proposal really look like? Um, the one that, that you mentioned earlier for the Futarchy as a service. Sure. So uh, for those who aren't aware, the prominent or the dominant uh, DAO platform today is called Realms. Uh, and yeah, you can set up DAOs in it um, and they're, they're token voting. Uh, and so this would look like Realms only for Futarchy. So you could come in and spin up your DAO or uh migrate an existing DAO to this um and then it would provide like the software uh to yeah, run Futurkey. And it would also it would be instead of like with realms you go in there and you place uh votes here you would just go in and it would be a UI for an order book or uh an AMM or whatever we wherever we land. Uh so yeah you'd place trades instead of votes. So smart listeners I'm sure are asking themselves what would the moat be? <laughs> that is you know, if you had the service, what would be hard for a competitor to replace in that service? It could be like how you did the software or the interface or something about that, or it could be something about how you know how to manage that process because you have experience doing it. Yeah, I think it's those. Uh, I mean, SaaS doesn't have great modes. It's not like a network effects business, but um, and obviously Salesforce uh, has pretty good modes. And I think uh the reason it's it's also just the status so like at some point um if you're seen as the platform uh it's 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 a political risk for someone to decide to go on a platform other than that uh because it, yeah it's like you can't get fired for buying ibm if we become the dominant platform maybe you can't get fired for choosing metadata uh i don't know i mean we'll see uh like I said, I don't think defensibility is super high, especially because like sort the source will be open, so like anyone will be able to would literally be able to copy the software. Uh, but hopefully, we can eke some eke some excess returns out. No, that makes sense. And we kind of glossed over this earlier, but I want to go back to Voda. What can you kind of dive through the differences on 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 what Voda is relative to this Futarchy as a service idea? Sure. Yeah. So Voda is uh, just a, I mean, it's kind of coincidental that it's related to governance. Uh, it's just uh, in Ethereum, uh, there are these platforms that allow you to trade your votes for money. Um, Vodium, Hidden Hand, uh, there's a few others too that I can't remember off the top of my head. And that's a pretty good business. Uh, I think uh, Vodium did like $50 million in revenue in 2021. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, we're building that, but for Solana, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, and we're starting with Sabre. Uh, so you'll be able to trade your VE Sabre votes, uh, for money. Uh, obviously this kind of highlights a, a problem in the voting system. So in that sense, it's like helpful, uh, to selling feed turkey as well. Uh, but yeah, that's. It's just basically a market where you can sell votes for money. I mean, this raises the issue that you didn't specify how, what the agenda mechanism is in your Futarchy. You said if a proposal is authorized, then the following things happen. But there's the risk of too many proposals for the system to manage. So how do you allocate proposal space? Uh, yeah, today we do uh, Dutch auction. So... Uh, right after a proposal is raised, someone had to pay like probably this sold price, maybe like ten thousand dollars or something, uh, and then that linearly decreases um, until someone wants to make the next one. Uh, we're going to have to come up with something better because obviously, like if this thing has a lot of assets in it, then uh, that's not super scalable. But yeah, that's what we currently use. I don't want it to be permissioned. Like, I don't want it to have some sort of council that has to approve which proposals are allowed to go through. Uh, that's what the DAO of 2015 had. And yeah, I'm not a, not a big fan. Now that we bring up the mechanics of voting, I'm curious, like, in a permissionless system, you could have, like, multiple, and you have had multiple proposals running at the same time. And what's, like, the interplay that you've seen the, between the two, right? Because if you when you start running out these aggregates of, okay, if this passes, here's the value. If it fails, here's the value. But then you do that concurrently for multiple, propo multiple proposals. Like, how does that work? Uh, yeah, so it, 
fragments liquidity, unfortunately, uh, especially today. Uh, I don't want to go too much in technical nuance because, uh, yeah, I could talk all days about like <laughs> micro optimi or optimizations we can make with Turkey. But uh, essentially, we have something coming down the pipeline that will help uh, disfragment that liquidity, um, the ability to merge conditional tokens. But uh, but yeah, it fragments liquidity. I think at scale, uh, you obviously, as you get more liquidity, uh, you can divide that liquidity more and it's still okay. Uh, I don't yet have like a solid, rigorous mental model of how much liquidity is needed for a given market, because that would be what would decide uh, what decides like how much you how many proposals you can run at once. But hopefully, we can figure that out with time. I mean, I'm aware of lots of you know recommendations I've made about more complicated mechanisms and approaches, but I'm very conscious that you can kill things by trying to you know require too much complexity too soon. So. Um, if they if they can handle their simple approach for a while, they should probably keep things simple. You mentioned this earlier that there's a five day voting window. How has the voter exhaustion been throughout the like five days? Can either be viewed as a really long time or a really short time, depending on the proposal. And like, I'm curious how you feel about that five day window right now. Uh, five days is too long, in my opinion. Uh, I'd like to bring it down to three days or even one day. Uh, one day is my target. I would eventually. Uh, maybe like five years, like, let's just say that this is successful, uh, or Futurity in general is successful. And there are AIs, uh, that are like, there are people that use AI specifically to trade Futurity markets. Uh, you would expect those AIs to be better, uh, traders than humans because they're like less biased and, uh, can aggregate more information and whatnot. Uh, and so if that's the case, you could even get proposals down to like 15 minutes or something, right? Uh, because AIs can obviously be online all the time. Uh, and you could also have like many proposals because they don't really have fatigue. Uh, but yeah, five days. Sorry, go ahead, Robin. I, I mean, I would think the key thing is the period that people have to review and consider a proposal before they start trading on it. The trading period doesn't have to be very long as long as people coordinate to just show up then. Uh, the key thing is if you, if you post a proposal and 15 minutes later have the vote on it, you're much more at risk of you know, bad proposals slipping in because people not only need to, to read it themselves and think about it, they need to discuss it with people, et cetera. And that'll just be a intrinsic, you know, time delay. People need some time to talk and think about it. Right. So today, it actually, the way it's implemented is you raise the proposal at the same time you start trading. But yeah, like over time, we'd probably want to delay that. Um, but the trade off is security, right? The shorter the proposal time, uh, the more a single manipulation, like a TWAP manipulation, can affect the overall TWAP. Uh, and so, hence, longer proposal times. But, you know, if if you don't need more than 365 proposals a year, you don't need much less than one day for trading, right? The, the rate is set by how many proposals per year can this community handle. And I would think 365 would be a lot for a community to handle. So, a full day of trading doesn't seem you know, a problem there. So I would think, you know, something like, I don't know, weeks to later review it and a day to vote on it. And you can get 365 proposals a year at that rate. And I don't think you need more than that to, to at the high level governance of an organization. Well, I would like to, I mean, I agree at like the board of directors level, which is kind of a CEO uh, example is an illustration of, I would like to have the market control a lot of the organization, uh, like as, I, I would like it to have inf basically to select as many bits as it as possible over the organizational uh, structure and, and, and all the decisions that are made. Uh, and so that's one way. Right. You can but but then an issue is the smaller a decision, the less impact it has on the overall meta token. And so you get down to sort of very small differences, which might be hard to see given trade of noise. So then it makes more sense for say if you have a shipping department. <laughs> decisions that you have a metric for the shipping department and you're estimating, you know, policies conditional on that metric, which is more targeted to that part of the organization, which then policies have a bigger impact on. So uh, I just, you know, it's going to be hard to imagine 365 proposals in a year that would have a substantial effect on the value of the overall token. 
uh, enough to be able to see the difference in, you know, yes versus no value. Well, that's, I mean, what you're describing with the shipping department being separated and having its own metrics, that's the plan, Robin. Like, that's why it's actually called right, but then, now. Right, but then you don't, you know, shipping department proposals can happen on the same day as, as marketing department proposals. They can just be in separate markets with separate metrics and happen on the same day. Sure. And I know it's still pretty early then, uh, but Robin, I'm curious, has the implementation, implementation of MetaDAO kind of taught you anything about the, the like practical uh, implementation of, of a futarchy? I hope it will, but I'm waiting to hear more details about, right. again, complaints and what goes wrong. Right. That, that'll be the, the key measure. I sort of, I've seen a lot of history of prediction markets going wrong in terms of what people didn't like about them. So I know I can tell you a lot about the problems they've faced, and I want to see whether this faces similar problems or a new set of problems. And I'm eager to learn about them from this and grateful the example will happen to teach us. Uh, one thing I'll also add on the long proposal times is the longer the proposal, uh, it's it, it decreases the incentive to liquidity. So like, say you have a very volatile spot market uh, and you have a five day proposal time, then I don't really uh, like that five, like let's just, and let's say a proposal would add a 5%, 5% of the value of the DAO, then uh, a lot of people won't want to trade because they're like, okay, this 5% difference is going to be negligible relative to like the token doubling or having over the same period. Whereas if you have a 15 minute right. proposal time, the odds are low. Yeah. And especially in this industry, volatility is most certainly a concern. Um, so that's that's a good flag there. And and profit, like, how would you define, you know, if you step back or fast forward a year from now and like look back, like what what defines success for you? Is it being seeing Futarchy kind of like like adoption of the Futarchy as a service model, or is it something else? Uh, what defines success for me is yes spreading Futarchy and Futarchy actually working. Like if we could run side by side trials or Maybe we can't do that, but if we could at least get a correlation where like it shows that DAOs who adopt Futarchy uh, perform better on X metric, Y metric and whatnot, uh, I think that would be success for me. And then, yeah, success for the DAO is like success for MetaDAO is just if it makes money. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And we kind of touched on this a few questions ago, but like... What's like a minimum viable futarchy, right? If like a DAO or if in the company example, like if only the shipping department was a futarchy and everything else was like, you know, controlled by the board or whatever it may be, like, is that like considered a futarchy or how, like, I'm curious how you, how your framework is for like the entire company being under a futarchy? Uh, well, yeah, one thing that we've talked about internally is like, if a DAO doesn't want to adopt a full Futarchy, maybe it could set up grants, uh, a grants DAO that's governed by a Futarchy. This isn't really as common on Solana, but on Ethereum, uh, in Ethereum DeFi, the way it works is like every project will allocate a bunch of money to grants that build, uh, to people who build stuff that make uh, the DAO like more valuable. So like tooling and whatnot. Uh, and so you could potentially set up a grants DAO uh, that just allocates money but then you get back to this problem that Robin talked about where like the smaller decision is the less impact it'll have on the price of the token. Uh, right. Like, I don't know, Gito, I don't know. I think their market cap is like $2 billion or their FTV is like $2 billion. And so if someone is going to raise a grant for a tooling, uh, say there's Gito as a future key, then that tooling grant is going to have negligible impact on the overall G Gito price. Uh, so that's like something we're balancing, but potentially, potentially that potentially you could use what Robin talked about, where you like define these metrics uh, and instead of like doing overall token price for the grants down. Um, I, I think we should notice that the relative value of Futarchy is going to be relative to how bad an organization is without it. <laughs> So this is going to be the most promising in areas where there's a strong perception that politics just messes stuff up. <laughs> uh, like where decisions are difficult, where they don't have good local metrics, where, you know, politics and personality overwhelms things. If you could find those industries, those places where that everybody sort of sees that's a big problem, and then you introduce Futarchy there, and then it has big wins, that would be the, the big win in the sense that 
you'd believe that you need this thing because this overcomes the corruption and the, and the stink. And it's a cleanser, basically. And, you know, a reputation of a cleanser is relative to the stink it's known to clean. So, uh, you know, if Prophet is a great leader in his organization and trusts him in that, you don't necessarily need Futarchy for that. I mean, it'll be fine. It won't hurt, but it won't necessarily help that much in contexts where other organizational methods are just going to make things work often enough. What this is going to be especially useful for is where there's the stink. So, you know, I encourage listeners and others to find the stink out there. Find out find out where, where people believe not only one organization is messed up, but other organizations who try to do the same thing are pretty messed up because it's just a hard thing to do. Introduce this there. And once one organization seems to be winning there, people will believe it's because it gets rid of the stink. Well, let me tell you, De like, DeFi governance stinks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's like, if you want to look for the stinkiest, stinkiest possible organizations, it's DeFi DAOs. Like literally, Parrot Finance, uh, which some of the listeners will know about, was a Solana DeFi DAO where people invested in a, an initial coin offering uh, and they had $80 million. Uh, and then like a year later, they decided to shut down. But instead of returning the money to the investors, I think, 90% of it went to the team and then they just left uh, because they voted for that. Uh, and so, yes, DAOs are very stinky today. And then obviously there's the Aragon situation of like literally a, a company that builds DAO tooling, not wanting to, not <laughs> trusting the DAO to hold the money after like five years of building this right. thing, seven years. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And we've seen a lot of innovation across DeFi. If you think back to the early days of Uniswap V1 into like, the DeFi landscape of today, there's been, there's been a massive, massive shift in, in, in creating really cool shit with the sole exception of governance. It's still one token, one vote in 95% of cases. Um, and, and to your point, Profit, there is an ample amount uh, of, of examples where we see corruption. Uh, and so I, I'm really excited that you're kind of being one of the first people to think about innovation at the governance level. It's something this industry des desperately needs if it wants to move forward. Um, and this is a very, very interesting application, right? So the, the ethos of crypto is like, you know, permissionless access um, with markets, like independent decision making. And so few target feels like the perfect fit from the ethos example, uh, or from the eth ethos aspect, as well as the application aspect, right? We just talked about why DeFi governance stinks so much. So um, Robin, Profit, this has been a fantastic discussion. I really appreciate the both of you joining us today. We'll put links uh, to, to all of your information in the show notes here. Uh, and just thanks again for coming on. I, I really appreciate it and really excited to continue watching MetaDAO grow and develop. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Thank <laughs> you.